the orbit. Grants the sector, 14th edition, pages 227 through 234, 15th edition, pages 245 through 252. The dissection order will be as follows. First of all, we will study the bones of the orbit. I would recommend using a skull in lab for this. And then we will use a superior approach to dissect the right orbit. Okay? We will then be able to study cranial nerves 3, 4, V1, and 6, and we'll follow them through the superior orbital fissure all the way into the orbit and to the extraocular muscles that they supply. The left orbit we will do slightly differently. Here we will use a so-called anterior approach and we will also study here the anatomy of the eyelid and remove the eyeball. And then we will also from an anterior approach study the attachment sites of the extraocular muscles. Some of our objectives for today are to identify all of the prominent bony features. This includes all the foramina and fissures because this is where we have the important structures passing through. Then we're also going to describe all the components that make up the eyelids. So that includes the associated muscles, these tarsal glands, are also called meibomian glands, all the connective tissue, fascia and conjunctiva. We're going to identify all of the extraocular muscles. We will describe their function and their innervation. We'll also have to identify all of the sensory, motor, and all of the uh, autonomic nerves of the orbit, and we'll trace their routes to and within the orbit. And then last but not least, we're going to identify the branches of the ophthalmic arteries and veins. Here are the dissector terms for today's lab, or at least these are the terms that are related to the osteology. These will be quite useful for review later on and the two images here I also have on the next two slides. To highlight just a few of the most prominent features here, we have the superior and the inferior orbital fissures. We have the optic canal and here color-coded to make things easier. We have a couple of different bones and their contributions to the orbit. Now we have the purple thing here is all maxilla. Yeah, and you can see the contributions of the maxilla to the orbit. They have very far medially in red, the lacrimal bone. Then you have the orbital contribution, so the orbital plate of the ethmoid bone. And then you have a large contribution from the sphenoid, which is the orbital surface of the sphenoid bone. And then laterally here, this is all from the zygomatic bone. This is the lateral zygomatic contribution. This is more or less what it's going to look like in the skulls in the lab. So your optic canal is located right here so that the optic nerve can pass through there. Then you have your superior orbital fissure, your inferior orbital fissure, and the different bony contributions. Yeah, especially interesting here is the contribution from the ethmoid bone because part of it is actually very, very thin. It is called the lamina papyricea and that can easily break. Here are some of our dissector terms concerning the surface anatomy of the eyeball, the eyelids and the lacrimal apparatus. You may already know many of these here. Uh, this continues on the following page, but it's good to review all of these. Especially the area around the medial aspect of the eye where we have the lacrimal caruncle and the lake and the papillae and punctae is an interesting area because this is where our nasolacrimal duct will begin and the last lab will be dealing with the nose and nasal cavity which is going to be interesting because then we will actually see how we have a connection that is established between basically the orbit and the nasal cavity. Most of the structures concerning the surface anatomy of the eye and the surrounding structures we can actually study on ourselves. Yeah? Quite obviously in the middle here we have our pupil and then we have the iris around it and then around well, where the cornea joins the sclera is the corneoscleral junction. Okay, if we look very far medially here is our lacrimal caruncle. This is a semilunar shaped little skin called the plica semilunaris. Then you have here the puncta, a superior and an inferior lacrimal puncta, which actually end up draining into the lacrimal, um, lacrimal lake and then the nasolacrimal duct. Uh, concerning the iris, 
be sure to review the muscles that actually lead to pupillary constriction or pupillary dilation. Which muscles are those? What nerve pathways are actually going to be activated to cause constriction or dilation of the pupil? Are there any pathologies you could think of that might affect this? You know, chronic pupillary constriction or dilation? Could there be drugs that have similar effects? Just a few ideas here. Here are the bolded dissector terms for today's lab. These will be quite useful for review purposes at a later time point. We're going to be performing the dissection of the eyelid and lacrimal gland on the left side only. Okay? So for this you're going to have to start off by reviewing the attachments of the orbicularis oculi muscle which has been removed in these pictures here. Okay, so you remember that it's actually circular, yeah, a circular sphincter-like muscle that surrounds the eye with these two portions, one which is the orbital portion and then the palpebral portion lying on the eyelids themselves. If you reflect that muscle immediately, you should be able to see the tarsal plate that is underlying it, and you can see actually surrounding it as well is the orbital septum. The orbital septum is a sheet of connective tissue that attaches to the periosteum at the margin of the orbit, but also attaches to the tarsal plates. You should also be able to see tarsal glands in both tarsal plates. And then you will find the lacrimal gland in the superolateral portion of the eye, which is actually called the lacrimal fossa of the frontal bone. You will need a scalpel to access this region and just follow the dissector instructions uh, to see how you actually get there. It actually has two parts. It has a palpebral part and it has an orbital part. Uh, what I find quite interesting is actually how the lacrimal gland works and how actually the uh, eyelids work because the tears are secreted here in the superolateral portion onto the eyeball. The eyelids actually close from superolateral to inferomedially. So that means that the um, dust or whatever particulate you might have on your eyeball is actually going to be pushed towards the lacrimal caruncle, towards the lacrimal lake. So it's being pushed from the top well, top right in this case to the lower left here, all the way over the eyelids. It's very much, uh, very much like a um, windscreen wiper on a car. So, and if we have a look at this in cross section, right here, so you can see here would be your superior and your inferior tarsal plates. Okay, you do have mybomian glands that are coming out in between the cilia of the eyes here in the superior and inferior eyelids. And so the sac here that is superior and inferior to the eyeball is the conjunctival sac. And we can really see one major muscle here which is important to elevate the upper eyelid which is the elevator palpebrae superioris muscle. In a cadaveric image, this is what it looks like. Your lacrimal gland would be located here in the superolateral margin of the orbit. And you can also see here the cut margin of the superior rectus muscle and the sclera and the iris. We're going to continue now by dissecting the right orbit from a superior approach. And the first thing we have to do is we actually have to get through the roof of the orbit. And for that, we will either use bone cutters and tap the ceiling, so tap the roof, or um, a chisel and a hammer, and carefully break through the frontal part of the uh, roof of the orbit. And in doing so, make sure that you go as far forward, so as far anteriorly as possible here, so all the way to the um, superior orbital margin. And it might actually be as you have the frontal sinus in the frontal bone, uh, that it actually in your donor might extend uh, all the way into the roof of the orbit. If that happens, that's uh, nothing bad actually. And then if you look medially, you should actually find also um, left and right of the crystal galli, of course the cribriform plates, and then if you look closer to the orbit, you will find these ethmoidal air cells. Those air cells too might actually extend into your orbit, and so if this is the case, or if it's the case with the frontal sinus extending to the orbit, you're just going to have to remove the mucosa that's going to line them. There's going to be a thin layer of membrane lining these sinuses. You 
pick that out and then you can also crack through this thin layer of bone to actually open up the orbit completely. The first thing you're going to see when you open up the roof of the orbit is a membrane which is called the periorbita. It's been removed in this picture here but you'll actually recognize it because you won't see any other, other structures yet because the periorbita is still somewhat in the way. So you should take a probe then, you should stick the probe posteriorly deep to the periorbita between the roof of the orbit and the periorbita and so you'll try and make it pass right here inferior to the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone right through the superior orbital fissure. So you'll take bone snippers and snip away at the bone here uh, of the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone and also here you can um, go and snip off the or fragments um, of the sphenoid and also the anterior clinoid process. And you might actually see, most of the time I see it when we just open up the orbit, you might actually see the frontal nerve shimmering through, very superficial, shimmering through just below the periorbita. Well, if you can see the frontal nerve, you can use this as a guide, and so you, you would use scissors starting from back here, uh, and cut through the periorbita, make sure you don't cut through the nerve accidentally, and you can cut it in all directions and then remove it, because that'll help you open up the orbit nicely. So, and if this is worked nicely, then you should actually be able to see a total of three nerves um, that are entering the apex of the orbit, and they pass superior to your extraocular muscles. The first one I've already mentioned is your frontal nerve, which is a branch of V1, and that passes through the superior orbital fissure, and um, it gives off or actually splits, and then it'll turn into your supraorbital nerve, which we can see emerging above the eye, and the supratrochlear nerve, which is right next to it. Your lacrimal nerve also passes through the superior orbital fissure that is heading straight for the lacrimal gland. This one will carry the secretomotor fiber that are necessary for tear production, and it's also a branch of V1. Then you have one more nerve, which is markedly smaller. This is called the trochlear nerve. This here will pass medially to the frontal nerve, and you will see it lying on the surface here of this muscle, which is the superior oblique muscle. So now we're going to start with the deeper dissection. You're going to actually have to pick, pick out a lot of the fat, which is called periorbital fat. It's important because it cushions the eyeball and protects everything a little bit here. So if you go ahead and you identify your first muscle, which would be the levator palpebrae superioris, you can cut this close to where it attaches anteriorly, and then deep to it you will find the superior rectus muscle. And on the deep side of the superior rectus muscle you should find this little nerve here, which is a branch of the superior division of your oculomotor nerve, which also sends off a little branch that goes medially to it and reaches the levator palpebrae superioris muscle. The interesting thing about the superior oblique muscle, which we've just seen on the other side there, is that it passes through this little trochlea device that changes its direction. Yeah, so now it attaches on top of the eyeball, which makes its motion from the resting position uh, a little more difficult to understand. So here is your superior oblique, and as it passes through a trochlea, it is innervated by the trochlear nerve, cranial nerve number four. And looking laterally, you should find the lateral rectus muscle. You might remember from the mnemonic LR6, SO4, 3, LR6, so it's innervated by the abducent nerve, cranial nerve number 6. You should also find this nerve here, which is called the nasociliary nerve. It's also a branch of V1. And you can trace it through the orbit, and you should actually see that it's much smaller than the frontal nerve. Interesting here is that it crosses uh, superior to the optic nerve. It'll give off several long branches that are reaching the posterior surface of the eyeball. These long branches are called long ciliary nerves. The long ciliary nerves are going to be the ones that bring sympathetics to the eyeball. If you keep following your nasociliary nerve, you should actually find this nerve which is called the anterior ethmoidal nerve. This is just a small branch of the nasociliary nerve. This is going to be the one that supplies some of the mucous membranes of the nasal cavity. Yeah, It has, an, has a terminal branch as well, and the terminal branch of this one would then be called the external nasal nerve. 
Now let's briefly turn our attention to the oculomotor nerve. Let's identify that in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. Okay, and the oculomotor nerve is quite interesting because it actually has two divisions. It has a superior division that will be innervating the levator palpebrae superioris and the superior rectus. We've just seen these as we reflected those muscles. And then it has an inferior division that will innervate the medial rectus and the inferior rectus and the inferior oblique. If you very diligently pick away at the periorbital fat, you might actually discover this little structure here, which is the ciliary ganglion. This is really important because this is the relay station for parasympathetic fibers before they reach the eyeball. Okay, so they reach the eyeball via short ciliary nerves. We know we've already seen the long ciliary nerves, which convey sympathetic fibers. The parasympathetic fibers that you come from the oculomotor nerve, they synapse in the ciliary ganglion and then travel via short ciliary nerves to the eyeball. Okay? And the way you find it is it's about a centimeter away from the eyeball. It's on the superior surface of the optic nerve and it's very small, only about two millimeters in diameter. So this is for review purposes now. We can see pretty nicely here's your frontal nerve. You see that it actually splits then into the medially lying supratrochlear nerve and the more lateral lying supraorbital nerve. You have the medial rectus here, which is a little deeper to the superior oblique. Superior oblique is innervated by cranial nerve 4, trochlear nerve. Then you have uh, down here, really big, the optic nerve. You have the internal carotid artery. You have the lateral rectus. LR is innervated by cranial nerve number 6. Then you have your levator palpebrae superioris muscle which is just deep to the frontal nerve and then deep to that again is going to be your superior rectus. And don't forget about your lacrimal nerve that you should be able to see here. It kind of goes parallel to the uh, lateral rectus muscle. So here's a deeper dissection of the orbit from the superior approach, and you can see that in this dissection all of the fat has been very nicely removed. So you can see your superior oblique is lying right here in the medial aspect, but also superior to the medial rectus. You can see the trochlear nerve, how it crosses superior to the optic nerve and then reaches the superior oblique. You can see a few branches here that are actually coming off of the nasociliary in this case, because this is the anterior ethmoidal nerve. You can see a little bony protuberance, which is always a good guide, which is the crista galli. And on the left and right, you would actually have the cribriform plates that usually in vivo house the bulbus olfactorius, or the olfactory bulbs. And then um, you can see, which is cut here, the cut end of the levator palpebrae superioris, and just deep to it, the cut end of the superior rectus muscle. You can see the inferior division of the oculomotor nerve traveling here, lateral to the optic nerve. You can see the lacrimal nerve coursing on its way to the lacrimal gland, which is going to be in the superolateral part of the orbit. You can see the cut end of the frontal nerve before it was able, well, before it actually splits into the supraorbital and supratrochlear nerves. And then within the middle cranial fossa, you can see the oculomotor nerve. One more thing we should have a look at, and this is actually pretty easily accomplished, is the ophthalmic artery, where it branches from the internal carotid. Most of the time, on its course through the orbit, it'll actually traverse the optic nerve, so it'll be superficial to it, or superior to it. Okay, It'll then reach the medial wall of the orbit, giving off several branches to the muscles. It does the same thing actually on the uh, lateral aspect, gives off muscular branches, and then anteriorly it continues all the way until it actually branches. One of the terminal branches is the supratrochlear artery and the supraorbital artery. Here's a clinical correlation to recall from lecture. This is about the ophthalmic veins. Remember that you actually have a lot of anastomoses occurring in the head and also in the face, and some of these can be clinically important. So specifically here you have anastomoses between the angular vein and the superior and inferior ophthalmic veins. Um, Remember that if you have an infection in this danger area of your face, you can actually get this infection to spread through those veins all the way into the cavernous sinus. If you then get cavernous sinus thrombosis, this is a very dangerous condition. And 
it can be clinically tested for, amongst other things, uh, by checking for the functionality of the extraocular muscles, specifically the abducent nerve, and to test if the lateral rectus, which is innervated by this nerve, works or it doesn't. The abducent specifically, as it is not protected uh, traveling in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, this is the one that just hangs pretty freely right next to the internal carotid artery, this is one is especially vulnerable to infections or cavernous sinus thrombosis. Here's another little review slide for us. We can see the levator palpebrae superioris, the cut end down here, and the other cut end right up here. Here's your optic nerve. There's a lacrimal nerve on its way to the lacrimal gland. Yeah. This muscle is the inferior rectus. We had to remove a lot to actually get all the way down to be able to view this here. Okay. Then you have your superior oblique, and again, just next to it is the medial rectus, and here is your ophthalmic artery, and this tiny little nerve going medially and anteriorly is the nasociliary nerve. Now we're going to do the left orbit from an anterior approach. I've copied in here a couple of the main parts that we're going to do. Just use a probe and explore the conjunctival sac, which has been removed in this picture here. Then you're going to be able to remove both eyelids and the orbital septum. And then you might actually find the trochlea super uh, medially. This is going to be interesting and important because this is where your superior oblique passes through. In brief, what you're going to do is you can take a probe and see if with help of the probe you can pick up the tendon of each of your rectus muscles and kind of like pull it forward and cut through it with scissors. You do that for all of the rectus muscles and you do that with the optic nerve as well and you also do it with your oblique muscles. Then you should be able to remove the eyeball. So you're going to have to take some forceps and remove as many fat lobules as you can so that you can view all of these nice structures here. Okay, One of the first things that you should be able to see is actually you should be able to see if you can find the inferior division of your oculomotor nerve. See, the inferior division comes out here and sends out branches to your inferior oblique, your inferior rectus, and your medial rectus. The superior division, on the other hand, comes out here and goes up to your levator palpebrae superioris and superior rectus muscle. It's important that you can trace your four rectus muscles, so it kind of looks like a cross here, to their common origin, which is the common tendinous ring. And make sure that you can observe all of those structures that actually pass right through this ring here, Okay, which would be most prominently here, your optic nerve. You might not see this, but it's good to know that it passes through, which would be the, the central artery of the retina. Then, of course, the superior and inferior divisions of your oculomotor nerve, your abducent nerve going to the lateral rectus, and the nasociliary nerve. Here is the dissection review as per the dissector. It starts off with the review of the bones that form the margin of the orbit and the walls of the orbit and all the openings that you might find at the apex of the orbit. Go and re-examine the middle cranial fossa and review the optic canal and the superior orbital fissure. Remember which structures pass through where. Review all of the nerves that you will find coursing through the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. and that pass through the superior orbital fissure. Review the attachments of the six extraocular muscles. Remember that there's the uh, common attachment site for the rectus muscles at the common tendinous ring. Also review the movements of the eyeball, especially in regard to differences if you're looking from the primary position or from an abducted or adducted position. And review the ciliary ganglion, in this case its location and its functions. And here are a few video links for you.